I'm just seeing boxes. I'm not seeing any slideshow. You oh, you know what? I need to make you a co-chair. Yeah, yeah. We have to be a co-host. You are now. I'm changing you to the host. You guys are in charge. So tell me what everybody can see. We're still seeing you. We're seeing so, the, the boxes of people. Okay. So that needs to go away. Do you know how to do the screen share to show a PowerPoint? We might, we might have to do, we might have to go back to what we did before. Let's hope not. Because I don't. At the very bottom of your screen, do you see where it says oh, yeah. right, share right. screen? Right. Share right. screen. Right. Share screen there again. You. Okay. Yeah. And I may have to do this again, portion of screen and share. There you go. There. Now, now we are seeing birds of protected lands. Perfect. Are you seeing that and only that? That and only that. Perfect. Oh, it's another miracle of technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jennifer and all, thank you so much for inviting us to speak tonight. And Jennifer, thank you so much for that very warm welcome. Um, everybody can hear me now? Everybody can see Diane? Um, so this evening, uh, we'll be showing you photos of the avifauna of lands that have been protected by the Peninsula Open Space Trust by post. Um, I'll introduce the topic and then Diane, who is the main speaker, will do most of the presentation and I will wrap it up with just a couple of slides at the end. So, um, Probably everybody knows about POST, maybe many of you are longtime supporters. Over the past 40 plus years, POST has protected from development over 125 square miles on the peninsula and in the South Bay. I and mean, it's truly an astonishing achievement. The dark green spaces on the map indicate POST protected lands, mostly in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. The lighter green are other protected lands and the 112 orange dots that you see mark the post projects. Most of them are now managed by various government entities and are open to the public. Our story begins in the summer of 2020 when COVID induced isolation gave Diane the bright idea of starting a bird photography project for post. And the concept was to create a photographic record of the avifauna on lands that Post has played a role in protecting. In the year and a half since then, we photographed birds on over 50 Post protected sites and created the website you see here, birds.smugmug.com, which I put in the chat. Um, at present, uh, the photo gallery holds some 2,000 photos rent representing around 200 avian species from 49 families. So um, to get on with the program in the Bay Area, we're fortunate to have a wide variety of habitats and the post protected sites encompass pretty much all of them. We have freshwater ponds and lakes and at the top you probably recognize Saucel Pound on Windy Hill OSP. In the middle is Horseshoe Lake up on Skyline, and at the bottom is Clearer Reservoir in Southern Santa Clara County. We have both fresh and saltwater wetlands and marshes, some along the bay and others on the coast. Moving inland, the slopes of our hillsides are covered with grasslands, oak savanna, and a mix of trees and grasses uh, and the brushy chaparral plant communities. On the slopes and canyons, we have uh, mixed forests threaded with riparian strips. And Post has also worked to protect the coastal headlands and beaches, including the shores of Año Nuevo, which you see here with the usual elephant seals. If you drive in rural areas, mostly on the coast side, you may come across quite a few farms and ranches with signs like this one at Petrero Nuevo Farm, 
which is at the uh, lower end of Tunis Creek Road. Um, this particular post protected farm is a favorite um, among cyclists like me because for many years they've had an honor system bike hut that provides food and drink for riders. <clears throat> These farms and ranches are part of Post's Future Farmlands Initiative. It's not widely known, but in San Mateo, San Mateo County alone, we have lost 40% of our farms and ranch lands to development just since the 1980s. And of course, that's a trend that Post is now working hard to reverse. So that's the introduction. We're now ready to show you birds that are characteristic of each of these habitats and we'll begin with the freshwater ponds and lakes and now I'll hand the presentation over to Diane. Oh, thank you Peter. Good evening I'm glad to be here with you. Um, this is very exciting for me. So let's go forward. I'm starting at Sausal Pond at the bottom of Windy Hill Open Space Preserve because it seems a good place to start. Windy Hill was the very first large conservation program a project I've taken my post. This is back in 1981. Because it's so shallow, Salsa Pond, of course, attracts dabbing ducks, such as this colorful male wood duck. Unlike most ducks, the wood ducks nest in trees, I've learned, sometimes up to a mile away from water. And to reach their nests, their feet are tipped with sharp claws that enable them to climb trees. Now, this adaptation is rare among ducks. These two females are far less flashy than their male consorts. Most likely because the females spend time on nests and they need to hide from predators. Mallards are the most common ducks we've seen on our post protected land project, and for good reason. These are very versatile ducks. They can live in nearly any wetland habitat, whether large, small, freshwater or salty, urban, rural, natural, or artificial. This adaptability has enabled them to span the globe, and it's estimated that there are over 10 million mallard ducks just in North America alone. Mallards fly fast, clocking in at 55 miles an hour and high. In 1962, a mallard was struck by a commercial airline at 21,000 feet. Now, this is a record altitude for a bird aircraft collision, at least at that time. Gadwalls, like this handsome male, are often found hanging around other ducks at Salsa Pond. They rarely forage alone, and I have learned that this is because they like to be in close proximity to other birds so they can steal food from them. Wading birds like this greater, or is it a lesser, yellow legs often forage along the edges of ponds. They are looking for small invertebrates and crustaceans. Like many late onset birders, we still struggle to differentiate the letter, lesser from the greater yellow legs. So preparing for this talk, I checked in with one expert. I read a long article about it. And at the end of it, he said, identifying this bird has given birders fits ever since there have been birders. And I guess that'll continue for us. The largest wading bird we see at Sassel Pond, Sassel Pond is a familiar great blue heron, one of the first herons I ever learned to identify. We used to live in Menlo Park, right by the San Francisco Creek, and we saw these herons often in nearby fields. So one day I was curious to see why, so I sat down on a log and I watched one as he just stood poised over a ground squirrel's hole. It stood there motionless, it seemed like nearly half an hour. I was getting bored, but its patience and mine were rewarded when the ground squirrel poked its head up and was instantly speared by the heron. The bird swallowed the squirrel head first and whole. Now watching that squirrel go down, its long neck was akin to watching the proverbial pig in the python. Song sparrows are common birds. We see them at Salsa Pond uh, and other areas around creeks, particularly in reeds. This one was interesting to us because it was banded in 19, well, about a year before we saw it by a, a friend, David Titoni at Jasper Ridge. In the, a year since it had been banded, it had traveled less than a mile to go from uh, Jasper Ridge to Salsa Pond. So these birds do not have a wide, a wide range of um, where they live. I'm switching now to freshwater lakes. This is um, Hang on a second. Someone is not 
muted who needs to be muted, and I'm no longer a host, so I can't mute you. Is there a way that we can do it at our end? Yeah, yeah if you should be able to make you that noise. Where do I go to find this? On the side, uh, at the bottom where it says participants, you click on that list. And then you find anyone who doesn't have the microphone with a red line through it. We're not and, seeing that on our screen. Okay. I think it stopped. Okay. Good enough. Okay. I got him. All Thank right. You. Thank, Thank you, you so Dina. much. So we photographed this wintering ringneck duck at Horseshoe Lake up in Skyline Ridge Open Space Preserve. And this preserve is one of many we discovered that are lining Skyline Boulevard between Highway 92 and Highway 17. So deep freshwater lakes like this alpine pond attract diving decks. This ringneck duck, for example, will dive to depths of 30 feet or more in search of food. Now, you probably have noticed, as we have, that the dark brown ring around the duck's neck is barely discernible, while there's a nice right round bill, uh, ring around the end of its bill that is quite prominent. And why they named this bird for its least visible field mark has always puzzled us. Okay, let's see if we get this going again. The largest freshwater lake we visited was Calero Lake in Calero County Park. Nestled in the eastern foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains, this park covers over 4,500 acres of varied habitats. We've gone back many times and seen very different landscapes. But it was here that we finally photographed our first member of the rail family, the elusive Sora. Now in our search for rails, we have learned that they are more often heard than seen. This Sora attracted our attention by a loud call that sounds like a horse whinnying. We spent the next hour waiting for this bird to come out into the open. It finally did, and we got a good picture of it. And we thought it was worth the wait. Some argue that the expression thin as a rail was inspired by this secretive bird family, what with rails being skinny enough to slip around through railed patches of reeds. Yeah, it's not gonna do it that way. Both Western and Clark's Greaves spend the winter at Calero Lake, and the best place to see them is at the end of the lake near the dam. As you probably know, Greaves spend virtually all of their lives in water, even building floating nests so that they do not have to walk on land. During mating season, the males engage in a ritual called rushing. They stand up and literally walk across the water in short stutter steps. Now, we've seen this a few times at Calero, but it happens so fast we've never caught the rush on camera, but maybe someday. Moving on now to uh, wetlands. They're interesting any time of the year, but particularly in winter because they have so many wintering waterfowl. Our favorite among the winter migrants probably are the north, northern pintails that frequent Bear Island. They are the largest and to our eyes, the most elegant of North America's dabbling ducks. Part of this Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge is made up of three islands and that were once used for salt production. In the early 1980s, Leslie Salt decided to transform these salt ponds into a large housing estate. When the company's development plan was approved by the Redwood City City Council, a small but determined band of local citizens protested by placing a referendum opposing the project on the next ballot. The referendum passed by just 44 votes, and I'm guessing that a lot of you took part in that battle. And so thank you, because we've enjoyed birding there. Besides ducks, Bear Island attracts large flocks of shorebirds, including curlews, wimbrels, and marble godwits. Now, these godwits always look delicate to me with their slim legs and beaks, and yet I've learned they are among the longest-lived waders with a lifespan of 20 to 30 years, tougher than they look. Wetlands also attract insects and, of course, the birds that help them. One day at Bear Island, we came across this pair of barn swallows with the adult feeding a chick that seemed almost as big as the parent. I recently came across an article about the most common species of birds on a global basis. Not surprising, the domestic chicken talk, tops the list. But the four most populous wild bird species are in order, house sparrows, European starlings, ring-billed gulls, and barn swallows. Ravenswood Open Space Preserve is a smaller saltwater marsh in East Palo Alto, and Peter and I have visited this marsh twice during king tides. 
We're hoping to see Ridgeway rails way, wading out the flood on boardwalks or on high islands. No such luck. But we did encounter this ring-billed gull, the third most common global bird, with a rodent in its beak. The Stevens Creek Shoreline Nature Area is a tidal marsh located beside Mountain View Shoreline Park. Post likes to describe this marsh as a bird of paradise, and it is, with its abundant water, fowl, shorebirds, songbirds, and even this bald eagle. Now take a close look at the eagle's feet with their long, curved, razor-sharp talons. These talons earned eagles the name raptor, which comes from the Latin rapere, meaning to grip or grasp. A bald eagle's grip is said to be about 10 times stronger than that of an adult human's hand. Once an eagle swoops down to grasp its prey, its talons stay locked on until the bird reaches land. On an Alaskan cruise several years ago, we saw a bald eagle that had caught a salmon that was too heavy for it to lift out of the water. For the next half hour, we watched that bird use its wings to swim about a mile back to shore. Only then could it release the fish. And had it not been able to swim to land, this eagle would have been pulled underwater by the salmon and drowned. The biggest show of migratory waterfowl on post-protected land is found at Don Edwards Wildlife Preserve in the South Bay. Alviso. Created in 1972 as the nation's first urban national wildlife refuge, this oasis for birds has expanded over the years to protect more than 30,000 acres. The green-winged teal, the smallest of the North American dabbing ducks, is a common winter visitor here. Its bill is lined with comb-like spikes that help the teal filter the tiny invertebrates that it goes for out of the water as it forages. To me, this little duck is the very definition of cute. Large flocks of dowagers and other wading birds gather at Don Edwards' New Chicago Marsh. And whenever we see these flocks rise up in a flurry of flapping wings, we look up, often spotting a raptor that has spooked the flock below. Looking at these two birds, we just couldn't decide, long-billed or short-billed, or maybe one of each. Large flocks of American white pelicans also gather at Mallard Slough and Don Edwards, fishing in groups like synchronized swimmers. First, they drive the fish into shallows and then dip their bills in unison into the water to feed. A fun fact, their bills are the most capacious of all birds and they're able to hold up to three gallons of water. While pelicans forage, white pelicans forage almost always by day on their wintering ground, but during the breeding season, they forage at night also. Because even though it's harder to see them, they can catch bigger fish in the dark. And this matters because an adult pelican needs to catch 150 pounds of fish to raise one chick from birth until it can forage on its own. This ring-necked fowler rope was a here-again, gone-again bird that led us on a merry chase last fall. We read reports of sightings late in the day, only to hustle out the next morning and find them gone. Now, red brick phallops are not exactly rare, but they often migrate offshore, only occasionally pausing at wetlands where we might get close enough to see them. We finally found a small flock feeding in Don Edwards' new Chicago marsh. Now, this phallop must have found something good because its tongue is still hanging out. Well, some snipe is another bird that is not so much rare as elusive. It bends, blends in so perfectly with the shoreline and vegetation that it's almost impossible to see unless you practically step on it. And when you do, it is up and gone in a flash. And that may explain why early 19th century sharpshooters who successfully hunted this shorebird were nicknamed snipers. This female tufted duck is a true rarity that appeared in Don Edwards last December. While a common bird in northern Eurasia, this tufted buck is an unexpected visitor to the U.S. Same is true of this ruff that turned up in New Chicago Marsh last spring. Our only other sighting of ruffs was in northern Norway, where we saw several gathered at a frigid lek. German birders who stopped by to watch the show called them Kriegflugel, best translated as bird that makes war. Having watched these male ruffs charging at each other in mock battle, hoping to impress the watching females, we thought the name apt. Laguna Seca, meaning dry lake, is a vernal pool located in northern Coyote Valley. Now, vernal pools are seasonal wetlands that form in shallow depressions that fill with rainwater during the winter. 
In spring, the water, the water gradually evaporates, leaving the depressions dry during summer and winter. When we first visited Laguna Seca last winter, it was a pond teeming with waterfowl. When we returned this fall, it was a meadow being grazed by a large flock of Canada geese and a smaller contingent of these greater white-fronted geese. Pescadero Marsh, Pescadero Marsh is the only extensive wetland on the coast side of the San, Fr San Francisco Peninsula. This 235-acre preserve includes several habitats, including a tidal estuary, fresh and brackish water marshes, dense riparian woods, and northern coastal scrub. The tidal estuary attracts shorebirds like this long-billed curlew with its incredible eight-inch long beak. Now imagine trying to eat, sleep, bathe, fly, and even mate with such a long appendage affixed to your face. But for curlews, their long bills allow them to reach the burrows of shrimp and crabs hidden deep in the mudflats. To make searching easier, the tip of their bill is controlled by separate muscles, so it can act like a finger probing for food. Pescadero's marshes attract squadrons of ducks, the occasional brant, and last winter, four juvenile tundra swans. These young birds were born in northern Alaska and flew more than 4,000 miles from their breeding ground to winter here in California. The riparian woods that border the marshes attract wintering songbirds, such as this yellow rumped warbler. Now, given that this warbler has a yellow head, a yellow throat, and yellow flanks, we've always thought it curious that it was named for its rump. We found this American goldfinch feeding on thistle seeds in the scrub edging the marsh. Check out this bird's crisp yellow, black, and white plumage. The American goldfinch is the only member of the finch family that molts twice a year, in both fall and spring. And because the spring molt requires large amounts of food and energy, this goldfinch is one of the latest songbirds to breed. It waits until midsummer to nest when foods like thistle seeds and nesting material like thistle down are readily available. If you've birded in the hills between the bay and the coast, you've probably moved through all of these sunny habitats. La Honda Creek Open Space Preserve is a relatively new OSP located above the town of La Honda, and its grasslands attract flocks of songbirds feeding on seeds and insects. One of the most colorful is the western meadowlark, a bird that stays well hidden in the grass most of the year. That changes in spring when the males perch on flocks, uh, rocks and fence posts singing for hours to attract a mate. The Sage Phoebe is a, wizarder, a winter visitor to this preserve. We often see them on fences and bushes surveying the grasslands below. Now these birds have been fly catching in the western half of the U.S. for a very long time. Paleontologists have found Sage Phoebe fossils in Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas dating back to about 400,000 years ago. Cowell Ranch State Beach, located on Highway 1, just south of Half Moon Bay, was unknown to us when we started our post project. Now it's one of our favorite stops. This handsome quail that we found there is just one of the reasons. Now, if you've probably observed, when quail are disturbed, they are more likely to run than to fly away. With their short, powerful legs, they can achieve ground speeds of up to 12 miles an hour. Now, in contrast, the average human running speed is more like 8 miles per hour. And by the way, that tear draped shot plume on the male's head is made up of six very gracefully curving feathers. The white-tailed kites we almost always see at Cowell hunting for voles, mice, and rodents are another reason we love this place. We're not sure just which of these this white-tailed kite had in its claws when it landed on a fence near us one day, but it seemed happy with whatever it had. We found this prairie falcon surveying the grass-covered hills of Calero County Park from a treetop. As its name suggests, this raptor prefers hunting in wide, open, grassy spaces. Now this bird is the rarest in our gallery. We caught our attention while we were hiking in the Montebello Open Space Preserve off Page Mill Road. It's so unusual, we thought you'd like to see two views of it. We knew at a glance that it was something unusual, but looking at our photographs, we were stumped. Identifying this bird was way above our pay grade. 
And so we appealed to our friend Brian Sullivan at the Lab of Ornithology. In addition to being the head of eBird Project for many years, Brian is the lab's foremost lab expert on North American raptors. And after much pondering and Peter studying him close-ups of various features, Brian came up with this idea. Our bird is a rare, rare, a rare red-tailed hawk, rough-legged hawk hybrid. Not only that, but according to Brian, our hawk was only the second documented occurrence of this hybrid. So as Peter says, that's our story and we're sticking to it. The acorn woodpecker is the iconic bird of the oak savanna habitats. And despite being named for their acorn collecting, we learned recently that these woodpeckers get most of their food flying, fly catching for insects. Now we saw this woodpecker at the Coyote Valley Ridge Open Space Preserve located in the Diablo Range foothills. For now, this OSP can only be visited on docent led walks. To preserve a spot, you need to contact the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. One of the best times to visit, they say, is spring, when the fields and the hills are covered with wildflowers. This dainty woodpecker, as you know, is the smallest of the North American woodpeckers. An adult downy weighs in at less than an ounce, and yet is strong enough to strip bark from trees. The hairy woodpecker looks like a downy on steroids. And yet for all their similarities, the, dairy, the downy and the hairy are only distantly related, which raises the question of why they have evolved to look so similar. Using data from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Feeder Watch project, a scientist at the lab noticed that when a downy is at a feeder, it will give way to the larger hairy woodpecker, but the downy will stand its ground and drive off other larger birds, such as a beefy northern cardinal. This led him to propose what he calls the downy woodpecker innocent bystander trickery hypothesis. The idea is that by evolving to look like the hairy woodpecker, the little downy is able to trick birds twice its size and leaving it alone when feeding. The olive side of flycatcher spends most of his time perched high in trees, flying out to seize its prey and then returning to the same perch. Each year these flycatchers fly pass through California en route to and from their summer breeding grounds, their summer breeding grounds in, their, in Alaska and Canada, and their winter grounds in the Andes Mountains. This is the longest migration undertaken by any North American flycatcher. They're really pretty birds also. Great horned owls live year-round in oak savanna habitats, hunting the grasslands for rodents by night and roosting in the trees by day. It's the largest of the North American owls. And curiously, they don't make their own nests. They usually raise their nests in, they raise their young in nests made by other birds. But for the last few years, a pair of them have been nesting in a crotch of an old eucalyptus tree in the Rancho San Antonio Open Space Preserve. Now we watched this nesting site for weeks this spring, usually seeing nothing more than two tough feathers and a pair of golden eyes. But our persistence was rewarded when finally a little white puffball began to peer out as well. In a few more weeks, the mother owl, owl emerged from the nest with her newly fledged chick. Great horned owls live 10 to 15 years in the wild, so we are hoping for a repeat performance next year. Chaparral, chaparral habitats may look dry and uninviting to many of us, but they are home to a surprising variety of birds. California scrub, California scrub jays are the most colorful as well as the smartest. The brain to body mass ratio of an adult scrub jay is said to rival that of a chimpanzee or dolphins. I used to think of Anna's hummingbirds as yard. We know now that they are native to chaparral where they feed on nectar flowers and uh, flower nectar and insects. But this hummingbird was once found only in Southern California and the Baja Peninsula. Today, however, the Anna's, Anna's range has extended as far north as British Columbia and as far east as Texas. And that's largely because of us. These hummingbirds tend to colonize new locations, even cold ones, based on housing density and the availability of flower gardens and nectar feeders. Golden crowned sparrows are common chaparral birds in winter. Then they leave each spring to their breeding grounds near the Arctic Circle. 
During the Yukon Gold Rush, miners referred to the sparrow as the no gold here bird because its song, three descending notes, resembled that sad lament. We saw this white-crowned sparrow practicing his song last winter while visiting Rancho Corral de Tierra overlooking Moss Beach. A recent addition to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, this rancho is best described as a work in progress. Finding it? Not easy. Its entrance is off a small neighborhood street in Moss Beach. Parking? They say they are working on it. Public access? You walk a long dirt road across through a large equestrian center to enter. Helpful signage? Not really. But the views of the ocean below make up for a lot. Our last chaparral bird, the rock wren, lives on rocky slopes in dry, shrubby areas. The male is a great singer with a repertoire of a hundred songs or more. The rock wren can live happily in such dry areas because it does not need access to water. Instead, it gets whatever moisture it needs from its food. Wooded areas are beautiful to walk in, but as we all know, they are challenging places to see and photograph birds. Many forest birds are often heard more than seen, and that's true of the stellar jay. These jays generally stick to the upper branches of tall trees, waiting to scold human interlopers with their harsh cries. They are also proficient mimics, often fooling us with calls that sound like red tail or red shouldered hawks, whether trying to warn us about nearby predators or to scare us away. We're not sure. We wish we knew. Far below the jays, the tiny ruby-crowned kinglets scurry about the trees, gleaning twigs and leaves for insects. Weighing just half an ounce, kinglets are the energizer bunnies of the bird world. They just never seem to stop, especially when you're trying to photograph them. And yet despite their frantic pace, they are said to run on just 10 calories a day. The pileated, of course, is North America's largest woodpecker. Its curious name comes from the Latin piliatus, meaning capped or crested. If you're lucky, you might see them hammering away at a dying tree or log. It's most likely that bird is searching for its favorite food, carpenter ants. When found, the woodpecker uses his barbed tongue to gather up any ants, larvae, and other bugs hiding under the bark. Like other members of the thrush family, the hermit thrush forages on the ground, hopping and scraping through the leaf litter in search of insects. The haunting song of the hermit thrush inspired Walt Whitman to include this bird in When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. This poem was Whitman's elegy to Abraham Lincoln, written shortly after the president's assassination. I'll read you just the relevant stanza. In the swamp, in secluding recesses, a shy, hidden bird is warbling a song. Solitary the thrush, the hermit, withdrawn to itself, avoiding the settlements, singing by himself a song, Song of the Bleeding Throat. The harsh repetitive call of the red-shouldered hawk is anything but haunting. These birds often nest in trees that line local rivers and creeks. We saw this one carrying nesty material to its nearby mate at Palo Alto's Arastradero Preserve. Nor would I describe the call of the spotted toy as haunting. During winter, these birds are happy with the vegetarian diet of berries and seeds, but when breeding season season begins, they become avid insectivores, switching to a strict high-protein diet of insects, worms, the better to feed their chicks. Wherever there is fresh water, you can lay odds that there was a common yellow throat nearby. Because these warblers nest close to the ground, their chicks are highly vulnerable to predation. To foil potential predators, the adult yellow throat sneak food to their chicks by dropping into dense vegetation away from their nest, sneaking through the undergrowth to feed their chicks, and then leaving by another route. The highway between San Francisco and Santa Cruz is dotted with headlands and beaches that have been protected by posts. We've been to several of them. These headlands are just magnets for harriers we've seen, or for uh, raptors. We've seen harriers there along. We've seen red-tailed hawks. 
we've seen a peregrine falcon. Now this one was interesting. It was on a cliff, a cliff high above Anya Nuevo Beach. And we wondered why. Then we noted these bar, uh, these bark swallow, excuse me, the bank swallow holes on the cliff sides with the birds flying in and out. Soon the falcon was dive bombing the swallows, creating panic among the gulls scattered on the beach below. Townsend's warblers pass through the headlands each fall on their route to their grounds in Mexico, their wintering grounds in Mexico. Once they reach Mexico, they feed almost exclusively on honeydew, a sugary fluid excreted by plant sucking insects like aphids. You've probably seen it in your garden. The honeydew is such a favorite food with towns is that some of the birds set up and defend territories around trees that are heavily infested. And even with this sugar high, the towns of warblers weighs in at just half an ounce. The common raven, in contrast, tips the scales at more than two and a half pounds. Despite its weight, the raven is an acrobatic flyer, often doing barrel rolls and somersaults in the air. And one raven was even seen flying upside down for more than half a mile. By the way, we've often heard that ravens steal eggs from other birds' nests, but this is the first time we have seen such a theft in progress. Today, squadrons about of brown pelicans are common along the coast, but in the years after World War II, they almost went extinct because of the wide use of pesticide DDT. Once DDT entered the food chain, it altered the ability of pelicans, as well as other large, long-lived birds like raptors, to metabolize calcium. As a result, their egg shells thinned and became too fragile to survive being incubated. The banning of DDT in 1972 came just in time to save the lives and the future of these historic looking birds. Like the brown pelican, the elegant tern also forages from the air, dropping like a guided missile when it spots fish. The fate of both these species depends on the anchovy supply. When anchovies are abundant, they have high breeding success. When the population crashes, as it did from 2009 to 2015, both species abandon their nests for lack of food. The only member of the Alcid family that we've managed to photograph is a pigeon guillemot, probably because it has those cute red legs that are easy to spot. It takes a long time to photograph a surf bird, probably because it looks a, long, like, a lot like other shorebirds, and we're still struggling to tell one sandpiper from another. The surf bird's winter range is among the longest and narrowest of any North American breeding bird. In winter, they can be found from Northern Alaska to Gerald de Fuego, a range of nearly 1,100 miles in length, 11,000 miles, excuse me, in length. In width, however, its winter range extends only a few yards above the tide line. The black turnstone's name comes from its foraging behavior. It wanders along rocky shorelines, turning over small stones and shells to look for food. And our last shorebird with this neon red bill and bright yellow eye is a hard to miss black oyster catcher. When researching oyster catchers, I learned that it eats practically anything it can find, including mussels, limpets, welts, urchins, crabs, marine worlds, and beater larvae. But nary a mention of oysters. At last count, Post has protected close to 30 farms and ranches. We saw this band-tailed pigeon over a field of Brussels sprouts in Half Moon Bay. While still fairly common, California Fish and Game Department says this band-tailed pigeon population is declining about, by about 2% a year. Habitat loss is probably part of it. Part of it is it's a very low reproducer. It only produces one egg per nesting attempt with a maximum of three nesting attempts a year. But another reason may be that Band-tailed pigeons are classified as migratory upland game birds. As such, they are still hunted in California. Blue House Farm in San Gregorio welcomes visitors to its farmer's market and you pick strawberry patches in season. When we visited, huge flocks of blackbirds were gleaning the fields and Peter caught this male brewer in perfect light as a post on a fence post. The last and most, most familiar bird in our presentation, perhaps, is this California toy. We saw it at the Andriati Family Farms Farms in Half Moon Bay. Seen on the ground, this largest of the sparrows looks a lot like just another plain brown bird. But in this pose, showing off his handsome collar and crest and flashing his orange eye, it looks anything but plain. That's a good reminder there is a beauty to be found in every bird, no matter how dull or drab it might, might appear at first sight. One just has to take time to look for it. 
So after pointing our camera at so many birds, we thought to give one a fair chance to look back at us. And so we'll close with this curious young pelican who flew in close to check us out. And I'll turn this back to Peter now, who photographed all these beautiful birds. Well, thank you, Diane. Um, so I usually get a lot of questions about the photography side of things. So I thought I'd close by saying a few words about that. Um, these days I'm using this Canon R5 full frame mirrorless camera. The coolest thing about this camera is what Canon calls AI autofocus. And when it comes to photographing birds in flight, it's practically magical. All I have to do is keep the bird in the field of view and the camera does the rest. It identifies the location of the bird, pinpoints the location, focuses on it, tracks the bird as it flies, maintaining focus as it does so, and all I have to do is keep pressing the shutter. Um, the net result is I have way more keepers than I um, got with the prevention of autofocus technology which by the way is much better than anybody can do, um, can do math. I most often pair the camera body with this 400 millimeter F4 lens. Um, many bird photographers prefer using an even bigger lens in order to get more reach, but this is the biggest hunk of glass that I'm happy to carry around in the field all day and shoot handheld, no tripod required. Capturing the image is only half the fun. For every hour in the field, I spend an hour or so curating and post-processing the photos using an Adobe product called Lightroom. <clears throat> curating means discarding 80 to 90% of the photo and IDing the remaining ones, the keepers. Here's a typical example of post-processing, sometimes called digital developing. We have, um, a strongly backlit subject, very common in flight photos, almost always seen in flight photos. Um, but the original digital image, which is called a raw image, contains much more information than a JPEG image. Actually, it contains more information than could be rendered on a screen. But the information is there, and in Lightroom, you use that information, in this case, to lighten the bird and bring out the plumage without at the same time blowing out the sky. In other words, without turning the sky from blue to a brilliant white. So that's a little bit about the photography side. So to wrap up, um, we hope you've enjoyed our quick tour of birds of protected lands. Virtually all the photos that Diane showed you can be found on the website that um, I described at the outset, and I put this birds.smugbuck.com in the chat feature. If you're interested, interested in clicking around, you'll find the photo galleries arranged taxonomically uh, the way you would in a field guide. Uh, you can click through from family to species to thumbnails <clears throat> to full size images. And by the way, the legal fine print says that, uh, which is this very fine print. Uh, says that anyone is free to use the photos for any non-commercial purpose provided only that the photos are credited um, to the photographer, that would be me. So with that, Diane and I will end. We thank you for your attention. Um, if there are questions and if the um, organizers I think we have the time and can figure out how to make the screen work, we'd be happy to entertain questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And I certainly would like to invite people who have questions or comments, uh, whether it's addressed towards the, the birds or the photographic aspect. I just want to say that that knowing both these birds in these places, I found many of these pictures to be really finely detailed and chiseled in a way that helped me to understand the bird in relation to its place. And I appreciate that very much. So um, let's see, you're getting a lot of compliments in the chat here. Um, many thank yous. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, uh, but I, I will allow folks to, um, if you have a question, raise your hand. I've gone back to my uh, 
gallery view so that I can see more of you. So if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand. There we go. Um, um, uh, Sridhar, you had a question. I did, yeah, just super presentation. And I'm so happy uh, to, to see this and to learn about this and learn about post. So thank you very much for organizing and putting this story together, just, just fantastic. Um, and you know, please, I, I would love to contribute in some fashion. So I would probably send you more emails about how I can help. Uh, and uh, I shoot a lot of videos in these some of these parks. Happy to contribute videos if if anybody's interested too. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And earlier in in the presentation, Sridhara shared a web link for, and I'm presuming it's yours. Um, yes. A yeah. video of the Grebes doing that mating behavior. Oh, yeah. um, thank you. Um, thank Calero. you. Great. Calero. Yeah. 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 Yeah, perfect. Beautiful. Just absolutely stunning. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. We haven't graduated yet to video. We're still working on the still <laughs> photographs. <laughs> I, I'm thoroughly enjoying taking videos these days. So it's, it's been a, but you, like you said, right, you know the problem. You have to carry a tripod, to make sure you're actually, you know, yes, there's, there's some fun aspects, but also frustrating. So, yeah. <laughs> I was told once that photographers know the closest places to look for unusual birds because they don't want to cart their equipment that far. So I was told photographers are often the best ones to ask if you're doing point to point birding. Okay, other questions, comments? Well, I'm just going to add one more thing. If anyone wants to find some of the places we've found, if you go on to post website, you can get a copy of that map we showed you, uh, worth printing out, and it's, it's, it's a marvel to study. I had no idea when we began that there were so many places that we didn't know about. And we've lived in this area for 50-something years, and how come we didn't? Because we just, we just didn't. Some well, of them are small, some are large, but please just treat yourself to seeing some of these places. Yeah, I, I mean, we've been post-supporters post since forever. And we didn't know the history of so many publicly accessible places are, at least in part, due to post. One of the interesting things that came out for me in your presentation was how many places you visited under this general rubric of post that are now on being run under other jurisdictions, for instance, a county park system or the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And I think one of the things that happens is that posts kind of middleman role of facilitating the preservation of land gets erased in public memory. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Over That's time. Exactly right. yeah. Yeah. That's one reason I think we were so surprised by some of the places we found. And we've, I've gone into histories of parks. Uh, each one we go to, I, I try to find out as much history from the point of view of who's operating it now. And sometimes they're good at sharing credit, sometimes not at all. But Post um, recently has realized when it's gone into agriculture that they needed a different approach. It, they weren't sure what they wanted to do with some of these farmlands. They didn't necessarily want to become farmers, but they are holding some of it rather than trying to turn it over to someone else. They're renting out the farms to tenants or they're working on conservation easements where the farmer who owns it keeps it, but he gets uh, some compensation for the easement. And if and when title changes, the easement goes with the title, protecting the land from development. And I know uh, you've done some birding in some of those areas, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a, it's a new area for post pushing really hard. And the other thing that's been so exciting for us in the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society is that post finally came to Coyote Valley, something I've been begging for years to have happen. And that, that area, which is the last migration corridor between the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Diablo Range, with so many species, is being protected. And it's a combination of San Jose, the city, uh, Post, and the Santa Clara Valley uh, Open Space Authority. It's, um, it's a dream come true from the point of view of our Audubon Society. And it Thank couldn't you have happened so without Post. That. Yeah. All right. Any other hands up? I'm looking here at my list of participants. Um, see who else is asking. And I also appreciate that, that, uh, 
you had about half San Mateo and half Santa Clara County um, in, in the pictures and representation. Then have you I'll shared this with the with the folks at Post Proper? We have. Good. We have. They've made use of some of the photos in various outreach materials, both both printed and online, and there are plans afoot to do more of that. Good. They should do this program too. <laughs> they may some time. Who knows? Yeah. Did, this is being recorded, uh, Jennifer. So yes, I we... did record it, and yes, it, it it is being recorded right now. Yes. And how would one um, how would one get access to that recording? It's on our website. Um, if someone will make me the uh, hold on, I'll, I'm just going to go to the website here. But uh, Davina, if you could make me a, a co-host again, um, I'm going to show folks where that is. And then you will know forever. That's good. Um, all right. It looks as though I can share my screen. So this is our home, our our uh, web page, the home of the web page. And if you go to meetings, where it says presentation, when you go to that, mm -hmm. you will see the upcoming meetings, and then below that are the session recordings. Excellent. Yes, okay, that's easy. Thank you. Great. So yeah, it's pretty easy, and and we are getting a lot of um, a lot of hits on this. People are going back and watching old programs, and I sometimes hear from people, you know, months later that oh wow, I you know I I just heard the presentation by so and so on such a topic. So uh, they do stay here. I gotta go look at skunks. <laughs> the skunk one is amazing. I've got to see that. Oh, I would, uh, really? I mean, I, I think I can get some other members here to, to vouch for that. But that was one of our biggest hits. I <laughs> bet. But I just saw that it jumped out at me. I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out that that, in fact, great horned owls don't like messing with skunks very much either. That, they, should, they just shouldn't go there. No, just shouldn't go there. So, yeah, that's that's how it works. And as long as we're here, I just want to mention for next month, uh, Laura Erickson is going to be our guest. She will be Zooming in from Minnesota, um, where she lives in the Duluth area. And she is the author of 100 Things You Can Do to Help Birds, wow. and also the host of the radio show for the birds, which is syndicated on some NPR affiliates and also available as a podcast. Um, she's a former employee of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as well, and um, she's one of the most enthusiastic bird experts in the country, and we're really looking forward to her presentation as well. Um, so uh, for those of you who are um, planning ahead, February 10th, you want to be there. Jennifer's birthday. All right. Okay. So anything more? Oh, and another group you should give this presentation to would be the Bay Area um, bird photographers. I, I was yeah, just yeah. going to make that comment, actually. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to. I'm probably going to write to Steve uh, Zamek and and uh, CCU, uh, asking for this presentation to be shared. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there were a number of. I was especially struck by the Northern pintail picture, um, which I thought was was lovely for really showing both the male and female. Um, I, I liked that one a lot, so. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much both. And there's an, if there are other questions, let me know. Um, Sonny, were you going to say something? I see that you're unmuted. So maybe you were gonna ask. No, just accidentally unmuted myself. <laughs> okay. Just here, absorbing it all in. You great look job, really Diane comfortable there on the beach. I don't know. Yeah. Peter and Diane, great job. Thank Thanks, you, Sonny. All right. Well, thank you again. We really enjoyed it. And well, thanks I again for inviting us. Happy birding, everybody. Thanks. And I hope that you will feel a, a welcome guest at any point that you want to drop in on our future meetings. We'd love to have we you. We will. I think yeah. we should. I'm uh, going to back a look at the skunks. Yes, exactly. Thank you to everyone for attending tonight. 
good birding in 2022. And we hope to see you at next month's meeting with Laura Erickson. So until then, go out and see some birds in nature. All right. Thank Farewell you. for now. Good night.